This is Jimmy Church of Fade to Black, and you are in the future because you're listening to Christina Gomez and Shifting the Paradigm. Howdy, folks. This is Lou Elizondo, and you are listening to my very good friend, Christina Gomez, on Shifting the Paradigm. This is Ray Sobs from the NX Network, and you're listening to Shifting the Paradigm with the intrepid Christina Gomez on the X. You're listening to the NX Network, KUNX DV, Kansas City, Missouri. Welcome to Shifting the Paradigm. I'm Christina Gomez on the Paradigm Shifts channel and on the X, the new mainstream KUNX digital broadcasting talk radio. Are you ready for this? Because we are about to embark on an hour and a half of UFO shenanigans and paranormal adventures. Right here is where we look and think outside the proverbial box. We jump down those rabbit holes where you get a red Tic Tac instead of a red pill. First off, make sure you subscribe and share these shows on social media to those who you think are having their minds and eyes open to the reality of the UFO mystery. All of these shows are great primers, and in the push for more clarity, transparency, and disclosure, the more voices demanding answers, the better. For those listening on KUNX Talk Radio and Affiliates, I have two other shows each week that only air on my YouTube channel. Mysteries with a History is live on Thursdays at 2.30 p.m. PST with my co-host Jimmy Church of Fade to Black Radio. And each week we cover a different topic in depth. This week's topic is reincarnation. On Fridays at 3 p.m. PST, the live show Strange Paradigms is where I and a different guest co-host cover all the strange weekly news and mysterious headlines from around the world. So definitely check out my website at strangeparadigms.com for all show archives, more information, and direct video links to my channel. Oh, and make sure to hit the notification bell on YouTube. Guess what? KUNX Talk Radio is doing a giveaway. You can get the UNX VIP package. You have the chance to win two VIP passes and hotel accommodations at the Midwest Conference on the Unknown. It is August 5th through 7th in Gerardo, Missouri. But wait, if you don't win, don't worry. There will be eight second place winners that will be selected to win two general admission tickets to the event. All you have to do is go to the unxnetwork.com to fill out the contest form right on the front page. Drawings will be held live on the Unex YouTube channel Friday, July 29th at 12 noon Eastern. It's free. You have nothing to lose. Good luck. My guest today is Joshua P. Warren. Mr. Warren is an investigator who pioneers the amazing relationship between the mind, energy, matter, and strange phenomena. He owns the Haunted Asheville Ghost Tours in his hometown in North Carolina and the Haunted Boulder City Ghost and UFO Tour near Las Vegas, Nevada, where he currently resides. The author of over 20 best-selling books has traveled the world investigating mysterious phenomena and made the cover of a science journal in 2004 for lab experiments regarding energy fields in nature related to the Brown Mountain Lights. <laughs> 
His podcast, Strange Things, is hosted on Coast to Coast AM that he started in 2020. It's an amazing podcast. You don't want to miss it. Let's bring in Mr. Joshua P. Warren. Joshua, welcome to Shifting the Paradigm. How are you today? I am doing great, and I'm so happy to be with you at last. I love this show, and uh, it's a real honor to be doing one of my first interviews in my new studio here in Las Vegas. Well, first off, congratulations on that, moving into your new place, having a very stellar studio. I was telling you like backstage that I really love that shade of blue for the background. I think it's a lot of fun and totally different. And um, there's a few things I want to ask you. First off, I have a lot of younger college age viewers and listeners not familiar with you and your work. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Sure. Uh, I was born in 1976, close to Halloween, uh, in Asheville, North Carolina, heart of the Blue Ridge Mountains. And in fact, my family has been there for many, many generations, going all the way back to the 1700s. And so I grew up hearing all of these wonderful, rich Appalachian tales, ghost stories, folklore. There are plenty of mysteries in the area, like the so-called Brown Mountain Lights. Brown Mountain is this big, dark ridge in the middle of nowhere in the Pisgah National Forest. And for hundreds of years, people have seen these multicolored balls of light floating around the ridge, and nobody can explain what causes them. And so uh, I got to explore that kind of thing when I was young. And I started writing and publishing when I was only 15. I published my first book at the age of 15, got a job at the local newspaper when I was 16. And I started going out and trying to get to the truth, to get to the bottom of these things. And I also have always had a very keen interest in science. And so I became an apprentice to a NASA Hall of Fame engineer named Charles Yost. And he taught me a lot about how to use scientific instrumentation properly so that I could go to some of these locations and try to test the environment, to document things. And so my work in media, it kind of dovetailed with all of my sort of experiments with scientific engineering, electrostatics, electromagnetics, how all those things might combine. And I've got to tell you, for years and years, I, um, I thought these were probably just mainly great stories, just ways to pass along interesting history, but I didn't think there was much truth to them. And even though I'd seen the Brown Mountain Lights, I figured that that was probably a natural phenomenon. But that changed a lot when I got into my early 20s, and I really started investigating haunted houses, finally saw my first ghost, actually was able to witness and videotape objects flying around in poltergeist uh, settings. And the more I researched ghostly phenomena, and I started, I wrote a book called How to Hunt Ghosts when I was 25, and it was published by Simon and & Schuster and did very well. The more I explored ghosts, the more I found that if, you, if you're serious with this field and you stick with it, eventually ghosts do connect to UFOs and cryptids and ESP and psychic phenomena. And it reminds me of that great quote by the writer Charles Fort in the 1800s. He said, you can measure a circle beginning anywhere. And so I now am at a point in my life where I... I've traveled to some of the world's most active places. You know, I've I investigated all of Vlad the Impaler's castles in Transylvania, uh, the Tower of London, the Mayan pyramids, you know, the Winchester mansion. I lived in the Bermuda Triangle for five years. And now here in Las Vegas, I'm researching what they call the Nevada Triangle, which is even weirder than the Bermuda Triangle. And at the same time, I just purchased my new house with my new studio and workshop and lab. I also found I had an opportunity to purchase some land near Area 51, even though that's a two and a half hour drive from where I am, at this extremely paranormal hotspot that's almost like a portal. It's a time warp. So I just bought that. And uh, so I have big, big plans to take everything that I've learned about ghosts and UFOs and cryptids, et cetera, 
the relationship between the mind, the body, and the environment, and use it to not only try to perhaps open portals for better or for worse, but also use this stuff for positive purposes, teaching people about how you can take what we've found about how these odd things manifest and materialize in the world, and then you can you can use that to improve your life and to manifest good things as well. So I, uh, I very much am interested in the paranormal, but also the metaphysics of how to take what we learn about these mysteries and apply them to life. What you said in a just few minutes, we could break down into a 10 hour segment. So let's kind of touch on a few things. And the first thing that you mentioned is that when you're looking at ghost stories and UFOs, there seems to be a convergence between them. Why do you think that is from your research? Well, you know, here's how I feel about that. When I really began to explore the connection between ghosts and UFOs and aliens and cryptids and ESP, I realized that the, the common denominator between them all was the deviation of space-time. And here's what I mean by that. When it comes to ghosts, well, people are often talking about seeing someone or something that existed in the past but doesn't supposedly exist in the present in the same way. So there we have an issue of seeing back in time. When it comes to ESP, it can be that way. Someone could be looking back through time or into the future, literally time, mentally time traveling into the future in order to be able to, to see what's happening there. When it comes to UFOs, often people, they encounter missing time, time slips. There are places where UFOs are often seen where time seems to flow at a different rate. As a matter of fact, in 2018, I was the first person who got to use a brand new invention called the differential time rate meter or DT meter. And this is a device that's used to measure any deviation in time. And it's not really supposed to pick up anything here on earth. But on my way to Area 51, on the side of the road, this nondescript spot in the desert, sure enough, I measured time slowing down by a fraction of a second. And there was no way to explain that. The media picked it up, and it became a big story, and everybody started talking about the Vegas time warp. But when after only after I discovered this spot, that's when people were like, uh, you do know that's one of the biggest UFO hotspots in the world, right? I was like, huh? All this footage has been captured at that spot that I didn't know about before. Uh, close encounters have taken place there. There's a guy named Sean Kevin Jason who had a, a heck of a close encounter at that spot in 1996. I went back out there with him on camera to confirm that that was the spot. So there's no question about the, the connection between you know UFOs and how that if they're able to travel through space and space time are connected, well, they're, they're somehow manipulating that. And then when we shift into cryptids, well, cryptids are very closely related to aliens in some regards. You know, you have these stories about people seeing something like a Bigfoot, and they're following it down the trail, so to speak, and then all of a sudden it disappears. The footprints just end in the middle of the trail, as if this thing has teleported somehow through space and time. And you find the same thing with the stories of the Chupacabra that I encountered down in Puerto Rico. And so when you, when you start seeing this common thread of time and you even consider that if time travel ever becomes possible to humans or a similar species in the future, they surely must be coming back and are possibly interfering with our experience and creating what I call paratemporal loops, which I wrote about in one of my books called The Secret Wisdom of Kukulkan. By the way, a lot of my books can be gotten just very simply for free. Uh, if you go to joshuapwarren.com, I've got a whole section. There's a lot of stuff on my website there you can dig into for free. But anyway, um, I find that when you talk to the smartest cosmologist and astrophysicist with the best instruments out there, they will tell you that 95% of what is out there 
is a mystery. It's either called dark matter or dark energy. We don't know what it is. But what we do know is that we, we've got the mathematics down pat to, su to supposedly approve, okay, this is what all the mainstream scientists are saying, to prove that time is a flexible thing and that it all depends upon the point of view of the observer. And so we don't know what all the points of view are in this universe, but if time is a flexible thing and we are sort of processing it at a, at a human rate, you know, whatever the human mind and brain is capable of doing, then there may be times where we encounter storms in that, in that arena, interdimensional weather uh, that give us glimpses of the past or the future, or there may be technologies out there that are allowing us uh, or some other species to warp these things artificially to create portals, pathways, tunnels in and out. And then sometimes we may just naturally have the ability to perceive these things organically because, you know, when it comes to the human mind, I always tell people, look, I don't care how much faith you have in science. A scientific instrument was envisioned by a human, created by a human, built by a human, calibrated by a human, used by a human, interpreted by a human. You cannot remove the element of the human experience from all of this. And that's why sometimes I believe we're able to perceive things that we haven't been able to document just properly, objectively yet, but we know we will. All of these things that you've mentioned, ghosts, UFOs, cryptids, time warps, can they be found in the Nevada Triangle? Yes. The Nevada Triangle is so fascinating to me because more... Well, for one thing, more planes have disappeared here than in the Bermuda Triangle. I think there have been like 2,000 disappearances over the past 60 years. And that's really odd because in the Bermuda Triangle, well, you have some of the deepest ocean on Earth. I mean, the, the Puerto Rico Trench is the second deepest point aside from the Marianas Trench in the Pacific. So when something goes down and water that deep, you kind of think, well, it just sank to the bottom and we're not going to be able to retrieve it. The Nevada Triangle goes from Las Vegas up to Reno, Nevada, and down to Fresno, California. And it's mostly barren land. So there's high visibility when you're flying over. There's not a lot of vegetation. Sure, there are cliffs and things, but a lot better than like the Pacific Northwest or something. Furthermore, you have some of the, if not the most sophisticated uh, Air Force technology here. You know, the, the United States government owns more of Nevada than any other state, about 86% of this state. So they're constantly scanning the skies and they're constantly keeping track of what's flying around. Where are all these planes going in the Nevada Triangle? I mean, nobody knows. And actually what's also kind of interesting, if you reduce that down a little bit, and maybe everybody watching can do this if you don't believe me, go to the Las Vegas Metropolitan Police Department website and you will see that they have an official page all about how many people disappear in Las Vegas every day. And you could say like, well, these are just people coming here, getting drunk on vacation and getting and doing something crazy. And But I don't know. I mean, it's just interesting. There are a lot of disappearances. But beyond that, OK, the UFO stuff goes, you know, with, without even exploring that any further. We have Area 51 here. We've got tons and tons of UFO phenomena. There are really weird reports of cryptids here, some of which I've never heard of before. But but, but I, this is really cool. I should point this out since I was mentioning Bigfoot. I don't believe that Bigfoot is some kind of a normal biological organism. I think there would be more evidence, more scat, more hair, just more everything. I think it must be more of an interdimensional being. But nonetheless, there have been at least two or three reports uh, in Nevada of people seeing what they believe is a Bigfoot in the desert, walking quite briskly from west to east. And then 24 hours later, there's an earthquake in California. So the implication may be there that whatever these Bigfoot are, 
Uh, is it possible that they're sensitive to the fact that an earthquake is going to hit California and, and they're heading east to get away? And could we use this to predict <laughs> earthquakes in California? But here is another big thing to consider about this state. All right. It's called the silver state, but it's because there's tons of silver here. But it's actually the largest gold producer in the entire United States. As a matter of fact, it's the fourth in the world. I think only China, Russia, and Australia are ahead of us. Tons and tons of gold here. Gold and silver are incredibly conductive metals. And we know there's some relationship between the conductivity of electricity producing electrostatic and electromagnetic anomalies and these paranormal experiences. Whether they're subjective or what we want to call objective, there is a connection. There seems to be a correlation. And so you have these extremely weird, erratic electrical fields all around this state. It's one of the hottest places on Earth. I mean, we're right down the road from Death Valley, which is the hottest place on Earth. So the air here is very, very hot and very, very dry. So these electrostatic charges that can build up that are often associated with paranormal stuff, they can just be so much more powerful here. You know, I have a Tesla coil. I have a bunch of them and Van de Graaff generators and all these things that look like they came out of Dr. Frankenstein's lab. And I have to be really careful turning them on in this climate because you talk about some lightning bolts. It's crazy. The, the glowing plasmas that can be created, all this stuff that looks very ghostly and paranormal. And you take all of that, everything in the environment and the geology, and you combine it with the history of this place. If you think about the fact that it's also known as the Battleborn State because it was created in the midst of the Civil War on Halloween, on October 31st, you have all of these gangsters that came here and helped settle the place, which were, you know, their bodies all over the place. They are still, you know, Lake Mead is getting lower and lower all the time, and they keep finding bodies the lower the water in the lake gets. And so you have all that drama from the crime and all of the human emotion that comes here to this day. I mean, like people come to Las Vegas to go into, uh, to enter a different state of mind. And when they are here, they're either going to experience ecstasy or absolute depression i mean like it, it depends it can go either way you don't know what's going to happen but it's extreme and you combine all those layers of human energy and emotion and ambition with the the natural background here and it it is combined into this phantasmagoria of activity which is a playground for someone like me who likes to study this stuff and experiment with it do you think temperature affects paranormal and other mysterious sightings? I think that all elements in nature have some impact on paranormal phenomena. It's a little different, though, from place to place. Like, for example, where I'm from in western North Carolina, when it gets really cold, the humidity drops and the air gets dry. And so you have much more ghostly activity when it's cold. But you take a place like New Orleans, where it's warm and the humidity is high all the time. Well, that's a very haunted place. So you say, well, why is that? I think it's because that the lower, uh, let me put it this way, the higher the humidity, the stronger the paranormal activity has to be in order to be expressed. So you can enhance a paranormal phenomena by lowering the humidity and adjusting the temperature, of course, helps do that because generally speaking, you know, when it's warm, you create vapor that fills the air. When it's cold, that vapor solidifies. And so I definitely feel like you have a higher chance of paranormal activity in a, a cold place if that's when the humidity drops. But here in Las Vegas, the humidity is low all the time, so it doesn't really matter. So there, it depends on the location. That's good to know. I've, I've come across a few articles that state that maybe temperature does affect or increase paranormal activity. So I did definitely want to hear your input. Joshua, we are coming towards a break. We'll be right back after this.
your 1 million gigawatt paranormal powerhouse. KUNX DB. BX. This is Micah Hanks of the Micah Hanks program right here on KUNX. And right now, you're having your paradigm shifted by the one and only Christina Gomez. source for alternative talk radio on the internet the x howdy folks this is lou elizondo and you are listening to my very good friend christina gomez on shifting the paradigm do you have an interest in the paranormal then you'll love the unxnetwork.com the x is your streaming audio and video for everything supernatural strange and mysterious like ufos bigfoot ghosts and so much more from hosts like Jimmy Church, Whitley Strieber, Micah Hanks, and Christina Gomez. Visit the unxnetwork.com show page for a complete list of all the paranormal programs you'll find on the X. Be sure to follow us on Twitter for updates at KUNXDB. Follow our Facebook group, Unx Network. Find the podcast on Spotify, iHeart, Audible, and Apple Podcast. It's time. It's new. It's the X. So, you love talk radio, then you'll love TalkStreamLive.com. TalkStream Live is always on, 24-7, with the best streaming talk shows. Find your favorite talkers and discover some new ones. It's free, readily available online, or on mobile with any smartphone or tablet. Finding your favorite talk shows all in one place has gotten a whole lot easier. Just go to TalkStreamLive.com. Be sure to download the free apps from Google Play or the iTunes App Store. Explaining the unexplained. The new unxnetwork.com. Hi, hi. This is Race Hobbs, head of programming at the new Unex Network. And you're locked on Shifting, Shifting the, the paradigm. paradigm with the intrepid Christina, Christina Gomez, Gomez. On, on the X. The X. This is Jimmy Church of Fade to Black, and you are in the future because you're listening to Christina Gomez and Shifting the Paradigm. Welcome back. With me today is Joshua P. Warren, famous paranormal investigator. So investigating the paranormal for decades, what do you think ghosts really are? I believe that most of the time when someone says, I've seen a ghost, that person has indeed seen some imprint from the past. 
Now, before I continue, let me point out that there are different types of ghosts. And the tricky thing is discerning one type from another, because on the surface, at first glance, most of them appear the same. So it's kind of like um, walking into a room and seeing a person standing there or walking into a room and seeing a projection of a person standing there. Uh, at first glance, you may not know that you're seeing two different things because they look so similar. And so I ultimately define a ghost in general as some paranormal aspect of the physical form and or mental presence that appears to exist apart from the original physical form. So what that means is we have, again, imprints, which I think indicates that there is some property of reality of space-time that is capable of recording whatever happens. And it may be almost like how we used to have the old recordings uh, on VHS tapes or audio cassette tapes that were just a magnetic signal, and even digital is a certain version of that. And so it's like the, the, the reality is a medium that can be impressed upon and things can be recorded in. And therefore, uh, under certain circumstances, these moments can be played or, or replayed um, at certain locations and witnessed by certain people. These are the variables that we're trying to figure out because it, it seems to me that, you know, right now we've done a, a pretty good job scientifically of explaining a lot of the simplest mysteries in nature. Now we're dealing with the more well, the most complex ones, the big questions that are basically philosophical in nature, and it boils down to why that, um, you know, why that we have so many uh, problems exploring and explaining this stuff is because there are more variables than we understand right now. Our database isn't big enough. But that said, a lot of these ghosts definitely seem to just be non-interactive, redundant, unaware, predictable imprints. On the other hand, then of course we've got the entities and those are the ones that really freak people out the most because an entity actually does appear to be independent, aware, interactive, unpredictable, just like the classic idea of a disembodied spirit something that has a mind of its own, that there is some aspect that survives the death of, of the physical body and that a person may have some choice as to whether or not to stick around or move on. Or maybe you're not even encountering a person at all. Maybe you're encountering some other spiritual being, which is why we have this you know, entire pantheon of devils and demons and angels and jinn and fairies and little people and i mean it goes on and on that's a whole whole other dimension of, of thought that that life um is so much more complex than what we are only able to perceive within our physical realm we we were just seeing a, a tiny sliver of what's there hearing a tiny sliver of what's there etc and then of course we have poltergeist activity and poltergeist is really um, in a category of its own because poltergeist activity, it tends to um, uh, to center around a certain individual or individuals as if the people involved are somehow uh, um, providing the, the power supply for this activity, whether that's being done consciously or subconsciously, this energy is being produced, which is uh, either feeding some other entity that is rambunctious and throwing things around or that that person is uh, a very powerful telepathic person and a very uh, powerful telekinetic person and that that person may actually be creating these telekinetic and psychokinetic bursts that are in kind of an uncontrollable fashion creating these seemingly random events and so those are some of your basic types, the imprints, the entities, the poltergeist. There are other areas you can get into, but um, the, I, I think that the, probably 75% of them are imprints. 
As I mentioned earlier, I have many younger viewers and listeners, and many have asked me about shadow people and cryptids coming from other dimensions, like the TV show series Stranger Things. What are your thoughts on the show? Does it hold any weight in regards to bizarre parallel dimensions from your research, or is it just a fun sci-fi TV show? Well, here's something that will probably amaze you. Um, you know, I host this podcast called Strange Things, which is owned by iHeart and the Coast to Coast AM Paranormal Podcast Network. And I, for years, I, I uh, hosted a show called Speaking of Strange, and I wrote a book called Speaking of Strange. And I've never seen an episode of Stranger Things. <laughs> and my wife has. She's She loves them. She, I honestly, I don't really have much time um, because I have too many projects going on. I don't watch a lot of TV that's not just straight up documentary. So I can't comment specifically on that show. Uh, I, I always hear it's fantastic, though, and someday I'll, I'll sit down and watch it. But as far as the concept of interdimensionals is concerned, um, this is this is where we need to be focusing on more because we we tend to to have these glimpses of these things with, with any type of paranormal phenomenon it, they seem to sort of pass in and out of our realm as if they are usually in another place that's why we call this stuff paranormal which means beyond normal. And that's why a lot of these TV shows that you see, and I've been on just about all the TV shows for many, I don't do too much TV anymore. I'm kind of burned out on being on TV. This is about as close as I get. This is doing what I'm doing right now. Uh, but what I fa found is that a lot of these TV shows, they're going out there and they're saying, we're going to document paranormal phenomena. And unfortunately, since it's paranormal, that doesn't mean it, no it doesn't normally happen. So how do you crank out paranormal activity every week? It's almost an oxymoron. You can't do that because it doesn't happen that often. And that is why you find a lot of exaggeration that goes on in many of these paranormal shows. And that, that exaggeration turns a lot of people off to the field because if all a person knows about paranormal research is what he or she watches on TV, you're going to think some of this is pretty cheesy and it's just typical, you know, reality. So um, that's why you, you have to distinguish fact from fiction. And that's why that it takes so long. It takes years and years and years of traveling around and studying this stuff and documenting things and trying to do experiments in the lab to get a little bit closer to what may be happening here. And the, the, all of these, you know, scientists, mathematicians, they're telling us that there are at least 11 different dimensions. Now, we can't honestly comprehend exactly what that means. But I always tell people, if you want to understand more about the closest, how you, how you can get a handle on this, uh, just get on the Internet. And especially if you just go to YouTube and just look up Flatland. Flatland. There's a, there's even a great uh, short little video that Carl Sagan did about it, and the idea is that okay, we essentially we experience a three dimensional world, and so if there was a land that was only inhabited by two dimensional beings, and we went down as three dimensional beings and interacted with their land, how would they perceive us? And as you'll see when it's illustrated properly. If we went into the, the world of a two-dimensional being, then uh, we would sort of appear and disappear seemingly out of the middle of nowhere. They wouldn't be able to see us in our entirety. They would just be able to see little slices of us, however we happen to appear at, in that slice of their reality. They would, uh, we would be able to see down into their world and, and apparently be omniscient. We would know everything that was going on in their world. We would be able to speak to them, and they would just hear a voice from out of the blue. They have no concept of up or down. They wouldn't know where the voice was coming from. And if you somehow reached down into Flatland and you picked up a little two-dimensional character and tossed up in the air and it flipped around and came back down, it would have no way of explaining what had happened other than to tell its friends that it had some kind of a, a mystical experience. All of these things that a two-dimensional being would encounter if we three-dimensional beings went down there, would be considered paranormal. 
And, and it sounds a heck of a lot like the things that we talk about encountering when we come into contact with a paranormal incident. The same kinds of stuff would occur if we have these limited uh, interactions and interfaces. And so that's why I think that, um, sure, there are, are some paranormal phenomena that uh, eventually will be explained. I think a lot of the brown mountain lights, for example, are probably a ball lightning type plasma. Um, but we are going to find that, just like the scientists are telling us, there are other dimensions. And space time is flexible. And so, therefore, we are going to open our eyes tremendously to the fact that there are other worlds. Those worlds are occupied by other beings. And right now, they're, they're bouncing into our realm. We might stumble into theirs sometimes as well. But uh, eventually, I think we're going to figure out exactly how to do this mechanically. I am very grateful that you explain such a complex topic in very simple terms. And I think people can get a better grasp of what's going on by what you're talking about, the, the flat plane. Now, you've mentioned the Brown Mountain Lights several times. From your research, is there a connection with Bigfoot and the natural occurring lights? Brown Mountain is one of the world's greatest paranormal hotspots. There are only two or three other places that might be kind of similar to it. I've been to the Marfa lights in Texas. They seem to be like a different phenomenon. And then there's the Hestelin lights in Norway, which uh, are similar to Brown Mountain, but they are um, they're in a valley instead of on a mountain. All of these places where people see these lights also are places where people tend to see cryptids. And of course, you know, a cryptid is just a creature that may or may not exist. Sometimes it turns out it's a real thing. Sometimes, you know, it may just be part of folklore, but it's fun to explore. And at Brown Mountain, for example, you not only have plenty of reports of hairy hominids like Bigfoot, but even more bizarre stuff like Pumpkin Man. And, you know, Pumpkin Man is this, uh, he's a bipedal, not very tall, like four or five feet tall, very large orange head, black eyes, very wispy body, and uh, which basically appears often at night and um, sort of harasses campers and sometimes even touches them inappropriately, that kind of thing. And that's, you know, that would be, that's a very w weird way of describing this, but it also sounds a lot like an alien encounter. Like maybe this could be some kind of little alien thing that's going in and like abducting people or messing around with them in some way. And that in the mountains, before we were obsessed with the whole alien thing, it was like, well, that's the pumpkin man. But nonetheless, um, these places that are paranormal hotspots are kind of like natural conduits for earth energy. So for example, uh, you have places on this earth where occasionally the weather patterns just converge beautifully to create some kind of a terrible thing like a tornado. You know, it's most days in Oklahoma, it might be just fine, but when the conditions are just right, the sky changes and this portal opens up which is a tornado, basically. You know, that's it's a big swirling thing that's sucking stuff from here to there. And now that that is atmospheric weather. But when you start pulling the lens back from Earth, you see that we have all kinds of weather happening here. We have gravitational fluctuations. We have all kinds of geomagnetic storms. All this space weather. And that's why when, when the sun is blasting the earth, the earth has this magnetic field, the magnetosphere, that's always kind of wobbling and shifting to adjust to that. And, and it also shields us from it. But as this field wobbles around, it induces these electrical currents that flow through the earth. And they pop out at some places more than others. And these conduits are where I believe we've got interdimensional weather. And so 
those areas are places where not only do you happen to um, have more of an overlap between where we live and where these cryptids may be, but it also would mean that these could be um, doorways that aliens and UFOs are taking advantage of to travel through, or that maybe when a, a UFO or some similar type of craft, you know, and I know call it a UAP or whatever you'd like, we all know what I'm talking about, but when one of them comes along, we don't know what powers these things. Maybe they need to recharge their batteries by flying over to this hot spot and uh, soaking up some of the uh, extraneous energy coming from the earth. Uh, there are lots of reasons that some of these places are outstanding, and that's why we need to focus on those places. That's why I bought this new land at this hot spot near Area 51. And over the coming years, I am going to be constructing a machine that I believe is going to help open some kind of a portal uh, because it's a place that's already already prone to those space-time fluctuations. And in doing that, um, I, I know I'm taking a risk. Some people say, you're, you're playing with fire. What are you doing? You crazy man. Don't do it. But I kind of feel like that if these things were so dangerous, then we would have been wiped out already. And the portal may just be a window we can look through where there's no real interaction. But I'm also going to take it very gradually. So if something starts to happen that I don't like, I can pull the plug on it. But um, I think we, ha we have to go to places that already give us an advantage, that have this kind of um, interdimensional fragility, and then give it a little extra oomph to break through that barrier and to have some of these uh, interdimensional encounters. You said my favorite keyword, portals. I am so fascinated with the research of portals. So with whatever you find, I look forward to what you document because it is such a mistake mysterious phenomenon that people really just don't know too much about. Now, there have been people that have encountered side effects for those that have entered portals from my research, specifically talking to Trey Hudson. And now we also see in places such as Skinwalker Ranch that believe that they have captured a portal on camera or have had people witness portals. So that is just one thing that blows my socks off every single time. But as the inventor of parasymatics research. You built a new workshop and laboratory to study strange activity in the Western United States. Can you go into detail about what you've been researching in a controlled environment? Yeah, absolutely. Well, I'm always trying to, to take what I learn in the field and adapt them into lab experiments and then see if I can turn that into an experimental device that I can use in order to, um, to create a, a positive experience for somebody. Because this stuff doesn't always just have to be creepy all the time. I think a lot of this stuff, it's inherently creepy because we don't understand it and people fear what they don't understand. But actually, there's no difference in, in learning about what, what transpires from a, a paranormal point of view that's spooky and turning it into a paranormal um, um, sort of asset for yourself. So for example, uh, without going into too much detail, okay, I've created some devices that you've probably seen, and we can talk more about any of these if you'd like. This is called a miraculous prayer board, which is a, a, a biofeedback device that is meant for manifestation purposes. I've always been a big fan of experimenting with the wishing machine. You can learn about all this stuff on my website. The wishing machine is a very odd device where you take something that you want to manifest. What, and it could be a ghost or a UFO, or it could just be, it could be anything you want in your life, a better job, a better relationship. Uh, you, you represent it on an input plate. And you, you go through this process of tuning this very weird circuit inside. And then you just set it around. And eventually what you find is that these things 
will manifest for most people as long as it's something realistic. So it's you, you can't wish to fly like Superman or to live forever. But if it's something that's possible, every single time I've used these things, they actually have worked for me. And that is why that I started becoming very interested in like, what is this? Is this just a placebo effect? And if so, how far can you go with that? How necessary is the hardware? How much can you do just through symbols and how symbols affect the mind? And how does all this tie into the tradition of magic? And so I started taking various tones that I thought created some really interesting patterns in sand using cymatics. And most people have seen this. You sprinkle sand on a little thin piece of uh, metal and you play a tone under it and the sand snaps into all these beautiful designs and patterns like snowflakes. And, and it doesn't just have to be 2D. If you put some kind of a, a semi-liquid substance in there like cornstarch and water, it actually raises up and it operates three-dimensionally and you create mountains and canyons and forms that ooze around. So I started taking water and I, I, I when I was in the Bermuda Triangle, I started there because I was testing the water from around the, the triangle. I started taking water and playing tones and then viewing the water under infrared light and ultraviolet light and seeing what patterns would emerge. And they were beautiful and just en 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 enchanting. You know, I was entranced by this. And I thought, what if I start taking a message and I interject that message into the tone and take a picture of the pattern it creates and turn that into a symbol and carry that symbol, this abstract symbol, is it possible that something about that message is going to be transferred into that symbol and into my brain that will allow me to start manifesting interesting and positive things in my life? I know this is a weird concept, but hey, that's what, I, what, that's what this is all about. So the first thing I did was um, I, I just recorded some brief messages like, I am attracting more money. I am attracting better health. I am attracting a successful project, you know, things like that. And then I got the image that was created in the water, created by Mother Nature, captured it on a computer, and then gave it to my wife, who is a great artist, and she turned it into a black and white sigil like this one. This is actually the, uh, the money sigil, which is very, very popular because people tell me all the time that they carry this thing around in their wallet or they put it on their telephone uh, or they put it on put it on the wallpaper of their desktop. It doesn't matter. And then they tell me like, I got the, the job of my dreams after I did this or I got some kind of unexpected check in the mail or uh, two or three people have told me about winning money. Of course, I live in Las Vegas, so <laughs> gamblers will try out anything here and they're always winning jackpots. And so what I did was I started creating more and more of these sigils and they're all free uh, on my website. If you go to joshuapwarren.com, you'll find a whole section of sigils there and you can download them and you can experiment with them. And I am so impressed with the results I'm getting from these sigils that I'm creating more and more devices that incorporate sigils into them. And I love the fact that there are people out there who want to experiment with manifestation techniques and magical thinking and all that, but they're not really comfortable with, with gadgets, you know, and this is a very organic and natural way of being able to connect with these manifestation energies and it's working and we're, we're trying to figure out exactly why. I really like the fact that you're bringing science and trial and error versus taking a leap of faith on something like this. So I want to say thank you so much on, on that. But we are coming towards another break. We'll be right back after this.
million gigawatt paranormal powerhouse. KUNX DB. BX. This is Jimmy Church of Fade to Black, and you are in the future because you're listening to Christina Gomez and Shifting the Paradigm. I want to thank all of you for listening to The X. But did you know you can watch live streaming video and catch your favorite video casts on the UnX Network YouTube channel? Wow, you mean I can watch The X shows anytime? That's right. Watch any show anytime, even binge watch your favorite programs. Which shows are on the UnX Network YouTube channel? You can watch Most Haunted with Dan Terry, Entity Voices, Paranormal Evidence, Paranormally Blonde, and Unexplained Phenomena Australia, and many more. Also, be sure and catch live coverage of special events and special broadcasts from the UnX Network. That's great. I'm going to subscribe to the UnX Network channel right now. Awesome. You can find everything you need to know about the YouTube channel at unxnetwork.com. That's unxnetwork.com. It's your one-stop shop for everything unexplained. It's the new mainstream. It's the UnX Network. Explaining the unexplained. The new unxnetwork.com. Are you ready to read about true paranormal events? Unex Media publishes nonfiction books about UFOs, ghosts and haunted places, time anomalies, cryptid creatures, and more. Just like KUNXDB Radio, it's all about unexplained phenomena. Visit www.unxmedia.com to see our list of great book titles by Debbie Ziegelmeyer, Gene Walker, Devin Listrom, Wayne Lawrence, Bill Spicer, and yours truly, Margie Kay. That's unxmedia.com. Gold loves chaos, uncertainty, and disarray. History shows us what gold does when people aren't sure, aren't sure about the government, the stock market, their jobs, or their retirement savings. Our national debt is skyrocketing. Gold and other precious metals are a defense measure against inflation and a stock market that might take years to recover. So what can you do right now to protect yourself? Call United Gold Group. We offer gold and other precious metals delivered securely within 72 hours. Are you worried about the stock market? We can also help you set up a real gold or silver IRA or a 401k. Safe and secure. United Gold Group makes gold ownership affordable. Call now and get up to $2,500 in free gold or silver with a qualified IRA. Call 800 753 8534. That's 800 753 8534. Or visit unitedgoldgroup.com. collection of strange objects collected from investigations so tell us what do you have stashed well for over 10 years i had a museum in Asheville, north carolina in the basement of the Asheville masonic temple and 
Unfortunately, uh, a couple of years ago, <clears throat> excuse me, a couple of years ago, it got flooded. And so uh, I did lose some stuff then, but that whole building, it's an old building. You know, it's uh, well over 100 years old. And so it needs a lot of reconstruction done. And that was around the time I also decided to get a house here in Las Vegas. And so I decided to pack up most of my really cool, weird stuff and ship it out here to Las Vegas, where I now have uh, some of it in two storage units and I have some of it in my house. I have to be very careful about what I put in my house because I'm not one of those guys who likes bringing dark, cursed, scary things home. I've tried that before and I've woken up in the middle of the night and seen things in my bedroom and I'm like, nope, that's that. I don't want to do that. I, I don't mind going out and studying this stuff, but I don't want it following me home. And so I have so many interesting things. Obviously I have a lot of weird technology. I have what Puerto Ricans believe is a real chupacabra skull. Um, I have alien crash debris from around the world, like UFO crash debris, uh, crystal skulls, cursed and haunted dolls, a lot of different weird objects that are either cursed or charmed. Uh, for example, I have a, a lantern that an old gold miner was carrying when he fell down a shaft and died. And oddly enough, it brings people good luck when they touch it and go to casinos, I guess because he was a miner and he was <laughs> he had a positive attitude when it came to finding treasure um and then but my favorite i, I, I here my i'll tell you my two favorite things my two favorite things are okay when it comes to spooky stuff i have dr raymond moody's psychomantium mirror his actual original psychomantium mirror and for those who have no idea what i'm talking about the psychomantium technique is one in which you stare at a mirror under a very particular set of circumstances. And if you do everything right, in many cases, you will see uh, the image of a deceased person. And then that person will literally step forth from the mirror. And you will have a fully interactive 3D experience with this, with this phantom, if you will. And so... Um, he took that mirror, Dr. Moody, all around the world, and thousands of people got to look into that mirror and have these um, life-altering experiences. And I now own this antique mirror, and uh, that is, it, it belongs in the Smithsonian. I'm very, very proud of that. But definitely the star of the show is Art Bell's wooden alien statue. Now, Art Bell was, of course, the creator of Coast to Coast AM, the radio program. And he lived in Pahrump, Nevada, which is about an hour from Las Vegas. And this is a very long story, but to make it very short, uh, a fan once created a wooden statue that ended up in Art's hands. And this is a custom-made, one-of-a-kind wooden statue that, named Carvel. There's a long story behind why this is, but, but basically this wooden statue, it's like, I think five feet tall, about a hundred pounds and Art Bell, who of course is in the broadcasting hall of fame. He would keep this wooden statue in his studio and uh, he would talk about it. Sometimes there's plenty of pictures of him with it, video of him with it. And when he was broadcasting all these classic Coast to Coast AM shows, he would he would often have Carville the Alien. And so um, at one point, Art contacted me and said that he had to get rid of this wooden alien statue because it was coming to life at night and scaring the bejesus out of his wife and daughter. And he said, this thing has got to go or I'm going to have to get a divorce or something. You know, this was not a joke to him. And so uh, I made arrangements to get this thing and have it shipped to my museum in North Carolina. And I didn't know what to think about his claim that his wife and daughter said it was coming to life. And other people had supposedly said they'd seen it move as well. I was just thrilled to have something that was so unique that belonged to Art Bell. He was one of my heroes. And so I... Uh, 
I'll never forget, you know, everybody says, well, does it move? Does it move? Well, here's what happened. Um, when I got this alien statue, I, uh, of course, I, I had to have a big sort of opening ceremony where I revealed this thing to the world. It had never been on public display like this before. And so I devoted a whole corner of my museum to this statue. And uh, I was, I, I called the local media and I, they were going to come out the next day and, you know, put it on ABC and NBC and in the newspaper and all that. So I, I built up this really nice exhibit around it. It had all these signs and pictures of him with art and the whole story, the backstory. And he was kind of up on a little bit of a, a stage and there I had all these new lights that I bought. The I mean, it looked really, really cool. And I was so particular about making sure he looked the right way that I was the last person in the museum that night putting the finishing touches on this display. And I left there probably around 11 o'clock at night. And then uh, the next morning, I had to be back about 9 o'clock. So I came in at 9 o'clock the next morning. Nobody else there. I was the last person to leave. I was the first person to come in the next morning. I walked in, I looked over at the alien, and this entire five foot tall, 100 pound alien statue had, I'm, I'm talking entirely, its whole body had shifted a good 30 degrees to the right. And I was instantly ticked because I thought, oh man, I put all this time and all this effort into like, you know, getting this thing set up exactly how I wanted, getting all the lighting right. And, and somebody's coming here messing around with me. But then, of course, I had security logs, and I was able to go back and check the security logs and confirm that nobody else had been in there. Nothing else in the entire museum was disturbed. And there were lots of things in there, both lightweight and heavy, lots of delicate things, lots of things hanging. Nothing else had been disturbed. And I have no idea to this day, how to explain how that statue shifted its body like that. So after that, Christina, I got, of course, a camera and put the camera on him 24-7, never moved again. It was just as peaceful as one could imagine, like he, he was happy at his new home. And now when the museum closed down, I had him shipped out here where he sits in my living room. He, he greets people when they enter my new home. Um, and I have not seen him move here, but I am going to get another camera and put on him. So um, he is one of the strangest things that I own. And uh, I, I'd love to see him move, but I, honestly, I'm kind of glad that he doesn't get up and run around the house because I might feel like Art Bell at that point and say like, okay, not for me. <laughs> I know what you mean. You got to separate your work life and your personal life. You do not want them to mix together. And especially when dealing with the paranormal or anything mysterious, I like to keep my home as a sanctuary. I want to keep it safe and happy and full of ramen. And I don't want to bring any scary entities with me. No, thank you. <laughs> but going back to the mirror by Mr. Moody, did you ever test it? Yes. Did you ever see anything? I did. There were a number of occasions when I would see things and you can use any mirror as long as, I mean, it's, it's nice to have a large mirror and the setting is very important. It needs to be in a dimly lit room. You need to have a chair sitting right in front of it. And the mirror should be placed just high enough so that you do not actually see your own reflection in it but it needs to be a very secluded environment. I even like to have a little white noise in the background. And Dr. Moody, you know, he discovered the ancient Greeks were using this method and he modernized it with the mirror technique. And he's a very esteemed physician. And so he was able to test this with a lot of college students when he was a professor and, um, and, and see that this was actually working for them. But in order for the technique to work properly, there needs to be a significant amount of mental preparation. Uh, Dr. Moody actually traveled to uh, North Carolina years ago and spent a weekend teaching me and uh, a group of other people how to do this properly. You need to spend at least a couple of days beforehand, if you can, really dwelling on the person that you want 
to contact. Now, you don't have to do that. Like, for example, if you just sit down uh, just randomly and you just put yourself in this situation for like 30 minutes without any mental prep, most people will at least start to see some weird little lights that start moving around the room. Uh, you'll feel as if you are floating at one point that you're in the middle of outer space. Uh, a lot of people hear a, a voice or a hiss, or they feel some cold breeze on their neck. These kinds of things happen to most people. I mean, very few people just sit down inside of a psychomantium environment and have no experience whatsoever. But for the full blown thing, um, uh, just for me, for example, uh, I had a friend who committed suicide. And so I spent two or three days trying to imagine everything I could about what it was like to be with this person. That's important. You, you rely on your memories a lot. And you try to remember what that person sounded like, uh, smelled like, what they felt like if you touched them. I mean, like what the energy was like when they would come into a room what that person's favorite things were, favorite food, favorite music. I mean, you try to remember this person. And if you have any object, which I did have an object from this person, uh, I was, was given a, a gift, as a matter of fact, a watch one time. And so you would take that and you would sort of dwell on that. And then after a few days of this, you reach a point where you go, okay, I don't think I can remember this person any more vividly. And I think I'm ready to go do this. And then that's when I, was, I sat down and there he was. It took about, I don't know, it's hard to, I didn't time it. It probably took 25, 30 minutes and he was there and um, he didn't really say anything. He didn't come out of the mirror, but there was this telepathic sort of acknowledgement that he was okay and that he loved me and he thanked me for my friendship and uh it was it was wonderful, but it was really sad at the same time. So it seems like it's kind of more of an intentional type of thing. It requires a lot of prep, a lot of work to really remember this person. And then when you look in the mirror, they happen to show up. I mean, to me, and my knowledge is very limited, it sounds kind of like, a, in a sense, sometimes a trick of the eyes. I mean, I have attempted looking in the mirror with candles and stuff, and I've seen things, but I'm thinking, is did I really see something, or was it my mind? And then it also leads me to the question, well, a lot of people had encounters with this mirror by Dr. Moody. Is it really their loved ones, or is it a shapeshifter, or a type of demonic entity? What, what can you say about that? Well, when it comes to mirrors in general, mirrors are actually a very basic form of portal. Because when you look at your eyes in a mirror, what is looking back? Who is looking back? We even use this as a test to distinguish certain types of animals. How does an animal react when it looks into a mirror? Does it have self-awareness? They think some dolphins may and some chimpanzees may. But one of the things that distinguishes humans is that we have this self-awareness. We look into a mirror and we understand what we're looking at to some extent. But the weird thing is it's also an infinity loop. Because it's like if you take two cameras and you point them at each other, well, what do you get? You just get an infinite loop, a tunnel that goes on and on and on forever and ever and ever. And the same thing happens if you point two mirrors at each other. So that's why if you go into a room and there are two mirrors facing each other, it just looks like a tunnel that stretches on forever. We can't comprehend exactly what that means because we're talking about infinity. And the human brain is not designed to think about things like infinity. We think of Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, you know, and then back to Monday. And therefore, um, okay, when two mirrors are facing each other and they create that infinite loop, well, what is that actually? Well, that's light because that's what mirrors are reflecting. And what is light? Light is an electromagnetic field. 
electromagnetic energy. So what we actually have here, when you have an infinite tunnel of light, you have an infinite tunnel of electromagnetic energy. This opens a very simple form of portal. And so when you are looking at a mirror, you're accomplishing the same kind of thing, except now you are part of the system. So when you have experiences looking in the mirror, sometimes they may be things that you are creating in your own mind, almost like a dream, something that's only for you, something that is indistinguishable from a hallucination. On the other hand, we also know that there is a real physical energy that's being manipulated here. Mirrors reflect light. That's energy. Your body produces energy. Your body is an electrical machine. When you put these two things together, there is something measurable that's happening in the environment around it. And so that is why I believe there is a combination of things that can happen. You can have a subjective experience, but there are other things that are uh, exiting this experience. And I'll give you an example of this. One of my friends wanted to contact a deceased loved one. So we created a psychomantium setup for him. And we put some night vision cameras in there. So the cameras were rolling unobtrusively in the background while he was having his experience. Now, he had a full-blown experience where she appeared and she came out of the mirror and he talked to her and all that sort of thing. When we watched the footage, we could see him interacting with her. We could not see any spirit there, any phantom there. But we did start getting some very peculiar orbs, and I'm not talking about dust orbs or reflections, very paranormal balls of light that began shooting around the room. And then we would pick up some kind of murmuring in the background that wasn't coming from him. And so when he started to have what he perceived as his interaction with her, the cameras started picking up something also happening in the room. The cameras were not perceiving the same reality that he was and vice versa. But that is why we always have to use all the means at our disposal when trying to document something paranormal. I was in a haunted house one time and I stood right next to a big ghostly blue gray mist. And there was another researcher there with me. His name was Rob and Rob goes, Josh, look. And I turned and here was this mist. And I'm telling you it was inches away. I was entranced. He was, we were speechless. I reached out and touched this thing. It was cold in the middle. It made the hair stand up on my knuckles. He did the same thing. So we're both touching this thing. And then it started to dim and dim. And I realized, oh, I got a camera around my neck. This whole time I had a camera. So I snapped a picture of it just before it vanished. And it came out in the picture. Not as clear as, as you know, if I'd done it immediately, but you can see it very obviously. It's on my website. Now, before this happened, the electromagnetic field meter, I was using a tri-field natural EM meter. It started just going bonkers out of the blue, showing there was some kind of electrostatic turbulence. Now, here's the thing about that experience. Now, for first off, I can't tell you that that was the spirit of a dead person. I, I, don't, I don't know what that was, but I think when a spooky mist like that appears in an attic, well, you, if you call it a ghost, everybody will kind of <laughs> give you a pass on that one. But what I found most telling about that is here I was in this attic with a meter, with another guy. We both saw this thing from two different perspectives. We both touched it. I got a picture of it. And still... What does that prove about the existence the existence of ghosts? What else can you do? What are you supposed to do? I don't have the Ghostbusters trap that I can stomp that will suck the thing in so that I can take it out and release it in the museum later on. Um, this is one of the fundamental questions that we have to ask ourselves in paranormal research. What is it going to take for us to say we have proof like what is the what are the, the requirements for proof of ghosts proof of cryptids proof of aliens 
everybody has their own terminology and there's very little consensus about all that, which is okay to a certain extent because, you know, we, nobody knows what the answers are here. We're all doing our best to explore that candle in the dark. It's like, you know, there, there was a, a whole story about people who are blindfolded grabbing an elephant and trying to figure out what it is. Each person just gets one handful of flesh, but they're trying to figure out what this elephant looks like. So I give you this as an example of how that we have got to study the mind-body-environment relationship. We can use simple tools like mirrors. We can use sigils. We can use more organic things like magic. We can take tools like some of these things that I've shown you, and I've got plenty more metaphysical inventions for exper experimental purposes on my uh, website in the Curiosity Shop. And, or you can go for, you know, hardcore nuts and bolts, scientific instruments that everybody has a consensus on right now. But the bottom line is this, we look back at what scientists knew a hundred years ago, and we're astounded by how much more that we know today. You know, back in the fifties, you had medical doctors out there on TV doing cigarette commercials and you know, the, the idea of, of creating the internet, I mean, having this exchange that we're having right now, this was not even anywhere close to being on the radar 100 years ago. We are constantly going to learn things. What do we think? We know everything right now? Of course not. Um, in 100 years, scientists are going to look back and say, can you believe in 2022 they didn't know this and that? We've got to do a better job of combining these techniques of mind, body, environment technology in order to gain a bigger, bigger picture of what's going on here, how the humans fit into all of this, and how we can take advantage of that to create a more positive world for everyone. Joshua, I have one final question for you. What equipment do you recommend for an up-and-coming paranormal investigator? I have got a short handbook that I wrote that you can download from my site. It's called Poor Man's Paranormal. And this is a guide that teaches you how to take simple, affordable household items and turn them into investigation tools. You don't have to go out and spend an arm and a leg. You'd be amazed what you can do if you just use a simple compass the right way. Or what you can do if you hold a fluorescent light bulb in your hand and you walk around to try to pick up electrostatic charges and watch to see if that thing illuminates. You can take AM radios and use them to hunt uh, for UFOs by looking for certain types of interference patterns. You can hunt cryptids by making your own sort of plaster of Paris casting substance in your kitchen that you can take out. And one of the great things about this booklet, this, this handbook, The Poor Man's Paranormal, is that usually if something paranormal happens at your house, you don't have the tools on hand to deal with it. Most people don't. So you can run and grab this thing and you can improvise and throw something together that's better than nothing. I would start by reading that because that, that handbook, it tells you the basics of the types of energy field that you need to look for. Very, very simple, affordable, accessible tools that anybody can use. And then from there, you can start moving more into like, okay, now I want to spend some money, get a very basic electromagnetic field meter, et cetera. But you need to really read the instruction booklet and know what you're doing because every, every piece of equipment is unique. And I even have an online course where I teach people all about how to use that stuff properly as well. Joshua, thank you so much for being on Shifting the Paradigm. The time just flew by. Where can people find you online to stay up to date with your research and where to get your books? I hope everybody will sign up for my free e-newsletter. takes you two seconds. And when you do this, you will instantly receive an automated email from me that's got links to all kinds of really cool free gifts that you can access so you can start this journey. You can start learning things and seeing what you like. Go to joshuapwarren.com. There's no period after the P. And if you go to joshuapwarren.com and you sign up for that e-newsletter, that's the best thing you can do. But also right there, you'll see all kinds of free videos in the menu. You'll find eBooks and links to other books. And of course, my curiosity shop is, if, whether you're gonna buy anything or not, it's just a fun 
place to go and click around and, be, and just be like, I can't, I've never heard of that before because I've got stuff there you will not find anywhere else in the world, I promise. Those were the exact thoughts I had. And I would like to mention that all of his links and places to buy his books are in the description box below. Joshua, thank you again. Hey, thank you, Christina. It's been great. You're listening to the UnX Network. KUNX DB, Kansas City, Missouri. It was such a pleasure to speak with Joshua and to hear all about his research and his journey and the decades that he's been in the field. I would like to mention that all of his social media links and books are in the description box below. Check out my website at strangeparadigms.com to catch all of the show archives in podcast and video formats, along with guest appearances and all of my social media links, such as Discord, TikTok, Instagram, Facebook, and more. Follow me on Twitter at eyes underscore on the skies to catch all of my updates and news. I want to wish you all a wonderful week. Please like this video or a podcast on your platform of choice and share it with those who have the same interests. Subscribe if you haven't already, because there's a lot more great shows coming to you soon. Be safe and remember, keep your eyes on the skies.